so I'm going to go through some of the examples um, that that uh, Modric has included as we work our way to, to 13 carbon labeling. OpNoc um, is one of these tools that was first developed to try to implement this optimal knockout framework uh, where the idea is, all right, we're, we're going to figure out how fluxes are optimally distributed when there's a gene knockout. And because tools in the early 2000s were very much based around this idea that you could make like one modification in the genome at a time um, in most organisms, uh, this, these strategies are often very sequential. They look at, okay, when you're gonna, if you're going to knock out one or two or three genes, uh, what are they going to do? Uh, but actually, op not, uh, if, if it wasn't the first, it was meant to be among the first that could, that could do more of the prediction. Um, so say what you're, the way that we normally think about things, we don't know necessarily what gene we want to knock out first. Uh, we know what product we want to make. Um, and so if we type that in as our bioengineering objective, um, then we, we sort of have this constraint. This is kind of, um, you know, uh, building in, I think, this MoMA concept, which is subject to still trying to maximize um, this cellular objective uh, and, and these other constraints. And usually, um, again, given the limited number of knockout tools uh, or their throughput, um, there would be some kind of cap that you would impose on the number of knockouts because you don't want the model to predict and say, for example, oh, you could just get rid of like all of these 20 genes uh, distributed throughout the genome and then you'd be at a fine place. And so, you know, an engineer might look at that and be like, uh, I can't do that very easily. Um, and you might also find that, um, you know, uh, there there, there could be, and, and I've seen this, uh, a different prediction for if you limited the number of knockouts to say one knockout. If you made the maximum allowable knockouts just one knockout, you might be told that this is the best single knockout. And conceptually, I just want you to realize that if you set the limit instead to two, you might not get, your best prediction for a double knockout might not include the first knockout. Because you can imagine that there is an alternative pathway where you'd have to knock out two genes uh, in order to really do anything about that pathway. And so what you're going to knock out instead is some other pathway. Um, and so, so these kind of parameters can make a pretty big difference on, on what's predicted. Okay. Um, so this is just, I think, the first more tables from the first paper uh, from the Moranis group at Penn State. Uh, that pioneered uh, and developed OpNoc, and they apply it to some of these different reactions. Uh, I think with the idea of uh, producing uh, maximal succinate. And you can see in the wild type um, that you get a flux of uh, only 0.2 millimole uh, per hour succinate, um, but that when you um, have a prediction that has these two knockouts, it predicts that you know, you would see an increase of nearly 10, more than 10 millimoles per hour of succinate with a, a corresponding decrease of, you know, 0 0.07 um, inverse hours of biomass. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, your, your rate of biomass accumulation. This is kind of like related to your doubling time. Um, this is your mu, I think. Um, and, and so, you might be perfectly content with the trade-off like that. And the question may be, would you rather go up to something like um, 15, where now your, your cells are, are doubling at less than half uh, the rate, um, but you now make more product? Something you want to think about there is, you know, experimentally, that may be too taxing. And really, the net amount of succinate that you're going to make and this is a little bit confusing. It's not straightforward, uh, although it is, you know, predictable by other models. Um, your growth kinetics mean that uh, you need to have, effectively, you need to have a certain amount of, of biomass um, in order to have more catalyst around. Um, and this should all be, I would think, normalized. Um, uh, for example, we saw in the model to gr gram per dry, uh, gram dry cell weight of, of your um, bacteria. 
Um, but so if you, if you actually have this low growth, um, it could be really detrimental to the net amount of succinate that you would generate for a, in a given volume over time. Um, but what makes that a little bit more complicated is with a lot of inducible strategies, you could actually create systems, which some engineers have done, where you have a phase first of biomass accumulation, and then you shift all your resources over to production. Um, and then you could even do something fed batch, for example. And at that point, you don't care if you're, you're, if you're still building up any biomass, but you still have to get to that point. Um, and these models are still under a steady state assumption. Um, you know, they assume also that your knockout strategy was just a straight knockout, not some kind of dynamic solution, which we'll talk about in a later lecture coming soon, that you could implement. I mean, just imagine conceptually that you had a valve and you could turn it to close off all of these reactions once you had wild type growth. So you could grow very quickly um, and, and have all, all the normal enzymes and, and fluxes that you want. And then if you could just degrade or disable all of these reactions, suddenly you would have a ton of biomass that you built up with very little succinate, maybe for the first few hours of your fermentation. And then you could just spit out a lot of succinate. So there's, there's that. Um, kind of empirical innovation strategy that, that you'd have to consider when trying to pick which of these is best. Um, any questions about what I just rambled about? Okay. Um, so these are, uh, oh, I didn't actually show you the Etcher diagram from, oh, no, wait, no, I did. Okay, never mind. Um, that these are the more standard representations of uh, metabolism that we've seen. In this case, where the fluxes are not, uh, the errors are not proportional to fluxes, but the numbers are, are the fluxes. Uh, and you can see, for example, in wild type E. coli, um, here you've got succinate, and uh, you can't exactly tell what the flux to it is, but at least from fumarate, it's just 0.12, it looks like. Um, Whereas uh, in these different mutants, B and C, um, you've got uh, in excess of 10 and, and here 12. Um, and interestingly, in this case, this is sort of what you would more intuitively expect where you, you would kind of take glycolysis and you prevent it from going to fermentation products and you route it uh, more into the TCA cycle, which makes sense. Uh, and then this is a, a scenario where actually you're gonna you're gonna try to send more flux um, through these steps here, and then find effectively a shortcut to pyruvate. You're gonna um, eliminate, uh, knock out the the reaction, the conversion of phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate. Um, here also a difference is um, you know this is like your PEP based strategy where you've um, changed glucose import too. It's not actually showing you the glucose reaction, but we've covered it in class for how it would come in alternatively. But this is a PTS system knockout here. Um, and then you can get to, to more succinate. And this is just a, a plot showing the, the different, you kind of overlaid with this optimality sort of strategies of, of where you are. Um, oh, and, and again, with the trade-offs of biomass production or succinate production. Um, and these, this is actually under anaerobic conditions, which is interesting. I um, don't know if this has been anaerobic the whole time. So um, you wouldn't expect much since it's a TCA cycle intermediate. Um, okay, and this is a similar idea for 1,3-propane diol. Uh, we don't need to spend too much time here. Other than this idea that 1,3-propane diol, uh, as far as I know, is not a native metabolite. So there's probably some reaction that's been added here from glycerol. Um, to get to 3-HP and then 1,3-propane diol. Um, and that is consistent with what we see here in wild-type E. coli, where there just isn't that branch at all. Um, so, okay. Oh, and also, I guess this alternative versus this uh, doesn't really seem to change the flux to 1,3-propane diol very much. Um, okay. Here are some PDO, that's your propane diol, um, limits under aerobic conditions. 
Okay, so um, I mentioned before, uh, thinking about kinetics can be really crucial um, because you have enzymes that you know really behave differently in terms of their level of activity based on how much substrate they have. Um, and we're trying to generate models that are telling us how much product we'll make over time. It's a little weird to think that you know, you're trying to get rate information in a way from this uh, steady state uh, material balance only kind of a approach. Um, and so you can imagine how a kinetic overlay um, would, would help provide better predictions, but it's just hard to have all of that information. Um, we have a hard time as it is measuring what the true fluxes are in each of these steps. Uh, and then to, what, what you effectively need for all those reactions that were listed in the big database per um, organism, um, you've got, if you've got a thousand reactions, you probably have a thousand enzymes that you need to um, measure the KCAT and KM for. And the thing about that is you've got to measure it on the right substrate in a way that actually tells you something true about the physiology of the organism. So one thing that's hard sometimes is if your goal is really to understand how fluxes are distributed in an organism, you need conditions that are very good at about telling you what is going on in the intracellular environment. And I mean, it's worth doing, performing biochemical characterization of, of enzymes anyway, but you might not get uh, such great kinetic information. And it still wouldn't affect, uh, uh, it still wouldn't ref reflect um, regulatory uh, information. So there is a kinetic version of OptForce um, that came out later. Um, it's called K-OptForce. Uh, I think if we zoom in, um, you know, this idea here is now for each of these reactions, you've got a more detailed mechanistic um, breakdown of what's happening. Uh, and because that's the thing too, not all of these um, reactions really proceed by Mikhail Smentin um, Kinetics. Uh, I saw that my internet connection seemed unstable, so I slowed down there. Um, hopefully you all can still hear me. Um, can I get a check on that? All good. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so if there, there are many different types of kinetic models, and um, you know, if you've got uh, bimolecular uh, transitions or decompositions or what have you, you'd want to have the appropriate kinetic equations for each and then uh, you're layering all of that. You can imagine that it makes your model prediction slower, but uh, there might be some optimization in the programming side that you could do to make this all run well and I think that is um, what's in K-OptForce. Get back to normal view, okay. And indeed, at least when chaos force was demonstrated, the addition of kinetic information improved predictions. You can see here E. coli under aerobic condition, there is a comparison between model predictions and experimental yields for five different products. We've got products across different kinds, some amino acids, some aromatics, some others. You got succinate again, a favorite of the modeling community, it seems. And this time naringenin, uh, which is a heterologous product um, that through the addition of some enzymes you can get to, um, in this case, from acetyl-CoA, but also from some other metabolites. And um, when you look at what FBA would predict, okay, so it would predict 0.99 of your yield. Um, so these are yield predictions, which is interesting. Um, the kinetic model predicts much closer in all of these cases. Um, well, this case is somewhat odd, but um, in some of these other cases, it's clear that the kinetic model is, is much closer to your experimental data. And you can see um, how with the addition of kinetic information, what genes uh, might be upregulated or knocked out, the pred those predictions uh, can be different. And that's exactly what this diagram shows, is that, oh, well, if I have kinetic knowledge, then I would actually knock out this transketolase, um, maybe. Um, and I don't know exactly why you would get that prediction, but, um, but there's probably a, a pretty rational justification for it. 